You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hello there. What are you doing in this part of town? That's some mighty fine cards you got there. It's not safe to be walking around with all that bling. Hey, hey, it's gonna be my. I don't know what I'm doing now, <laughs> but I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks. And I'm Jordan Pridgen, and we're outlaws today. Today we are. We're committing some grand larceny. None of that petty larceny. <laughs> no, grand. <laughs> Only grand. It better be beautiful. <laughs> We are upgrading the brand new Grand Larceny Precon. It's green, it's blue, it's black, it's from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, We're going to be talking about some theft. We're going to be talking about some borrowing. Mm. Borrowing Uh, without the intent to give it back. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to tell you what 10 cards to add to this Precon and 10 cards to take out of it to get it in fighting shape for your next game night. But before we get into it, if you want to pick up any of the singles or sealed product that we talk about in this episode, go over to cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom is a huge selection of magic singles and sealed product. They have all of the different printings of all of the different cards that you could possibly want for your commander deck. Maybe you're a chaos printing person and you're like, I want all the wackiest printings for your deck. Or you're like, you know what? I want all of them to look the same. Or they're all full art. Luckily, Card Kingdom is a huge selection of singles. You can get exactly the card that you're looking for for your next commander deck. Maybe this one. Uh, plus, you can pick up any of the precons or the sealed product from Outlaws of Thunder Junction if you're into cracking packs or upgrading precons. And if you're here, you're probably into upgrading precons. Go to cardkingdom.com slash command to pick up all of the cards we talk about in this episode and more. And then, Rachel, once you've bought all those cards from Card Kingdom, uh-huh. how are you going to protect them and, and put them in stuff? you got to ra- put them in stuff? <laughs> yeah. Go to ultrapro.com slash command. Oh. <laughs> Ultra Pro has the highest quality magic accessories in the business. Plus, they have all of the officially licensed magic art. So you can get sleeves with your favorite commander on them, like Gonti, perhaps. The one we're talking about today. Or if you like any of the art, if you're into cowboy core, uh, <laughs> they've, got, they've got a ton of Outlaws of Thunder Junction stuff, and it all looks amazing. I'm sporting the Marchesa mat. Uh, this one looks like the Archangel of the Tides oh, reprint. Oh, yeah, super it's cool art. stunning. You can see the cool, like, double gun thing that they did for this set. Um, I mean, not, not a gun, gun. Not a gun. Whoa, wait a minute. Not a gun. No guns in Thunder Junction. Ultra Pro has <laughs> incredible high-quality accessories. You can get uh, the best deck boxes in the satin cubes and towers. You can get the best sleeves in their new Apex sleeves, which they have for Thunder Junction specifically. Go to ultrapro.com slash command to see what they got today and look for some sweet, sweet deals. Finally, you can support us directly over at patreon.com slash command zone. All of our patrons get access to some very cool perks. Uh, you get to see game nights and extra turns a day early without ads. Pretty sweet. Uh, you also get to hang out in a Discord with us. Yeah. We're in there talking about cards, answering questions, talking about the spoilers as they come out. Uh, join our Patreon and you get access to those cool perks. Plus, we shout out one lucky patron every single podcast episode. And this one is dedicated to... Ooh, Eric, Eric Chang. Chang. Eric, you rock. You rock. All right, let's get into it. We're talking about the Grand Larceny oh Precon. Boy. We're going to give you 10 cards to add to make it awesome. We're going to tell you what 10 cards to take out to make it even more awesome. We're going to use a budget of $50 where you tend to leave the mana bases as is. But before we upgrade any of this deck, we, of course, just need to get to know it. Yeah. So first, we're going to talk about... The face commander. And this is Gunny. G- Gunty. <laughs> Gunty. Canny Inquisitor. Uh, yeah, I, I was really excited when I saw that Gunty mm-hmm. was the face. Gunty's back. Love old Gunty. Gunty's awesome and a beloved commander card, oh, despite yeah. being like a little outpaced these oh, days. Oh, I still throw him into black. It's still Ball awesome. Top. He, uh, Gonti, Canny Inquisitor, is two black, green, blue for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature, Aetherborn Rogue, and it says spells you cast but don't own cost one less to cast. But how often do you cast spells you don't own? <gasps> well, with Gonti, pretty often, because he also says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, look at the top card of that player's library, then exile it face down. You may play that card for as long as it remains exiled, and mana of any type can be spent to cast that spell. 
Pretty good. Yeah. So Gonti trade, traded in their death touch for green and blue. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I think a, a fair trade. Pretty good, pretty good upgrade. We've uh, been working out. Mm-hmm. He's buffed. To, he's buffed up to, up to he's a five five. Swall Gonti. Uh, and he's doing exactly what outlaws want to do, right? Which is hit people and steal their and stuff. Take their stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Armed burglary. This card seems awesome. Seems super fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, why play your deck when there are three other decks at the Perfectly table you good play? decks you could be playing. Uh, I would expect a Gonti deck to sort of be full of evasive creatures. You yep. want to make sure you're dealing combat damage as much as possible. And then probably just a stack of ways to steal and cast your opponent's stuff. Yeah. Um, also, I would expect a lot of ramp. Um it, it strikes me as the upside of like a Gonti type strategy because mm-hmm. you're getting so many cards from your opponent's deck. You can really fill your deck with just like the meat and potatoes you need to make sure that they're like working, you know? Definitely. I You're going to need, you're casting your opponent's stuff, which isn't necessarily going to be great for you. So you want to make sure that you have all the mana to be casting as many spells as possible. This is yeah. a quantity over quality situation. <laughs> In a weird way, he's ramping card draw on a commander. Yeah. And that's always a pretty powerful card combination it's always good yeah. uh the back of commander is very popular and he's awesome uh it's felix oh boy. five boots he's an ooze rogue <laughs> that's a lot of boots <laughs> where'd you get those boots felix i know where you got four of those boots from but what's the story with the, getting one the extra solo boot? one yeah that was our question with felix is uh how many of the boots match yeah do, do, you, do you think he went to, like, uh, a, a, a cobbler think, and was like, make me five boots? Five exactly the same. I don't <laughs> I don't know if he's that precise. I feel like if he just finds a boots, he's Felix six boots, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, if he loses one, well, four boots today. He just happened to have those boots. I'm sure he could have made as many or as few tentacle yeah. feet as he wanted, but he was like, I got all these boots, might as well use them. He's also <laughs> Felix two fingerless gloves, which oh. is pretty cool. Uh, but let's read him. It's two black, green, blue, five man all together for five, four with menace and ward. If a creature you control dealing combat damage to a player causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Neat. Pretty sweet. So we've seen this text a lot. If mm-hmm. you do this, do it again. Yeah. Always good. If you poke him, you know, poke you get, him twice. You get two pokes out of it. Double poke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can kind of see how he works with Gonti uh, because Gonti himself is a combat damage trigger. Yep. Um, but I would imagine the 99 of these two commanders to look very different. Yeah, because you'd want to have a ton of things that are just triggering whenever you do that combat damage with yeah. Felix. Felix cares less about your opponent's stuff and is more about hitting people. He's, yeah. like, he's like, you know what? I find stuff all the time. All right, I keep finding boots on the ground. I don't need to steal anything. I, I would want my deck to be more consistently putting those pieces out instead right. of getting these random pieces from other people's decks from playing Felix. Yeah, I think uh, if you want to deal combat damage and you're playing evasive creatures with triggered abilities or like Toskies that are triggered by yeah. other things, then Felix is your guy. Uh, if you want to steal your opponent's stuff, then Gonti is. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to know this deck a little bit more, and we'll figure out which one is in the command zone. But I will tell you, lately, it's been the face commander has been uh, the best for these. Although, I, I have to say, one thing I, I like about Felix, mm-hmm. even though I, I don't necessarily think... You know, spoiler, I'd put him as the face commander for the yeah, thing. Yeah, it's about Grand Larceny. It does feel like he fits really well with the Gonti, mm-hmm. like strategy, though. And I feel like they've had a, 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 a habit of kind of putting in backup commanders that don't necessarily feel like they even fit in the deck on their yeah, own. that are more side quests. Felix is a support piece for yeah. Gonti. All right, let's talk about what is in this deck specifically. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about the notable reprints. These are all of the reprints that are in the deck that are worth $5 or more in this deck. There are seven of those. Uh, we're going to run through them real quick just so you can tell what you're getting when you pick up this sealed product. Uh, the first one is a Golgari filter land. It's Twilight Mire, which is currently sitting at $9.50. Not bad. The next one is a big old blue enchantment, beloved in chaos strategies. It's Mind's Dilation, currently sitting at $9. Big crazy card. Uh, another card that loves to steal its Brain Stealer Dragon, sitting at $7. Got some swanky new art, too. Uh, the next one is the Blue Black Pain Land. It's Underground River, sitting at $7. Dark Slick Shore is a Blue Black Fast Land, sitting at $6. Three Visits, 
ever, the expensive card is $5.50, even with all the reprints. And we got an Edric Spymaster of Trest reprint sitting at $5. Oh, Edric. I still think of him as like one of the OG, like, boogeymen of like EDH. busted commander. Oh my god, it's Edric! The funny thing is, I feel like we see him way less as a busted commander these days, and way more as a group hug card, which is sort <laughs> yeah. of what he was intended to be. Yeah. Uh, He's way more par for the course now. I mean, for sure. you can make busted Edric decks, but... You still can. It's just not like those decks have sort of gone by the wayside. Uh, unless you're out there still playing Edric. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> against your, you know, Narset pod and all yeah. of the like busted, like Joyra of the Gitu. Oh, man. <laughs> Brings me back. <laughs> those are the most notable reprints in this deck. We're going to talk about the total reprint value. Uh, of course, this only includes the cards that are actually reprinted. We don't have the value of the new cards uh, or any of the cards from the main set. Uh, so it'll only include 74 cards in the deck. Um, and we are currently seeing pre-ordering for this deck around $40 to $45. So our data is going to be based on that range. If you can find it cheaper or more expensive, these things have been fluctuating a lot lately. So... Uh, all of that said, the total reprint value of this deck is... $121.75! Alright. Yeah, so I'd say if you can find the deck for 40 bucks, that's a steal. Hey! <laughs> Yeah, I $121 I I think feels low because we've had so many just wildly high reprint values lately, but $121 used to be something that we were very excited to see yeah, in pre-cons. That, that would have been real primo. Yeah, um, so I'm having a hard time like being down on this reprint value despite it being like the second lowest of the reprints uh values in thunder junction we, we've been a bit spoiled recently yeah but i think they should continue in the direction of like spoiling Keep people spoiling <laughs> we we've been talking about the bang for your buck value because these precon prices that uh range so much yeah that it's been a little bit more helpful to tell you what that reprint value is divided by the amount of american dollars that you spend so the bang for your buck value for this is two dollars and 71 cents worth of card value for your one dollar cash so not quite tripling your value but like pretty good yeah can i say also how yeah. much i love the fact that three of the high value reprints are just like good valuable lands yeah the blue black lands have not caught a lot of reprints lately seeing yeah. underground river that expensive makes me really glad that this is just a box of decent lands that you can throw into your deck well and it's so nice that like you know a new player getting a game or someone playing this can like get some solid lands that are some value mm -hmm. because especially when you're starting out it doesn't feel good to like buy lands. no it's so boring yeah. and you and then you're playing with these terrible lands and you're like why is my deck so slow and it's not about their deck it's because all of their lands are tap lands yep so it's really nice that these are usable mana bases. We got some decent reprints in the lands section and a solid reprint value, if not something that we're, you know, throwing confetti over. Uh, speaking of throwing confetti. Yeah. Wonderfully done. Flawless. Thank you. Sport. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, all right. The, uh, we're, we've talked about what's in the deck financially. We're going to break down what's in it mechanically uh, in just a moment, which means it's time to break down the... <laughs> stats. Oh pretty good. Boy. All right. I'm going to go through these stats pretty quick, and then we can talk about them yep. all afterwards. First, we're going to talk about the vegetables in the deck, the thing that goes in every deck to make them tick. There are 16 pieces of ramp in the deck. There are five dedicated card draw cards. Five. We'll talk about that in a moment. There are nine pieces of targeted interaction. There's one board wipe, and there's 38 lands, of which 15 are basic. So let's just talk about these vegetables for a second, because these are kind of wild numbers. Yeah. Uh, high ramp, which we talked about in the beginning, and is I probably think that's good. good. I, yeah. I mean, I, I always err on the side of too much ramp in my decks, at least. Especially when you're casting, like, some of the spells in here are big X spells or, like, big payoff spells. Yeah. You do need the ramp to get there. Uh, only five pieces of card draw is weird. That seems crazy to me. And yeah. I think I get their reasoning behind it. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, well, you're drawing cards from your opponent's deck. You don't need as much card draw on your deck. But that's not how it really works. 
Yeah, this deck has a lot of ways, which we'll talk about in a second, to cast your opponent's spells. We can already see yeah. it on Gonti. We can, like, those are card advantage. They give, they give you additional access to spells. But if somebody cuts off your engine, if somebody removes Gonti or board wipes and you don't have any more creatures... You're really going to be dead in the you water. You need a way to rebuild from your own decks to get your plan online. So this five-card draw is low, and it's definitely something that we're going to look at fixing. Yeah, absolutely. Nine pieces of interaction is all right, especially if you're going to be taking stuff from your opponents. I think nine is honestly a little higher than I normally spend, but yeah. you insult, I go nuts. I, I normally play a little bit more than that, but I assume yeah. you will be getting interaction from other people's yeah. decks and stuff. And I know in theft decks, when you like, you know, accidentally pull interaction from someone else, it often feels kind of bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. It's nice to, to know that y- this number is bolstered by the selection you're getting from your opponent's decks. Uh, only one board wipe is quite low. I These days, I'd like to see two or three. There's a lot of word running around. There's a yeah. lot of really scary cards that you're just going to need to handle the board state. I know we've disagreed about this in the past, yeah. but I feel like more and more in games, I'm sitting there a lot of the time going, oh my God, I wish I had a board wipe. Yeah. So... I'm I'm just always the one with creatures on two, three, and <laughs> yeah, four. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a creature-heavy deck. I, it's not a control deck, so you know you do want to commit creatures to the board early. So I could see running a fewer number of board wipes, but one is too low. Mm-hmm. Cool. Specifically to this deck, there are a number of categories that we wanted to discuss just to get to know how the deck works. This first category is theft. These are cards that explicitly steal from your opponent's board. Or, like, puts them into play without you having to cast them. Because it's different. It doesn't use, like, Gonti's cast uh, or ramp ability. So it's, like, thematically on the same thing, but not necessarily all that synergistic. But sort of something else. There are five cards that are specific theft cards. There are 22 cards that cast your opponent's spells. That is a ton. Some of those rely on combat damage. Some of them are sorceries. Some cast from hand, some from their graveyard. But 22 that just cast all of their stuff is wild. Which is great. That seems really fun. Yep. (laughs) Uh, I mean, that's what the deck is doing. There's no mistake if you include 22 spells like that. Yep. The next category is saboteurs, which is a term that Scryfall uses for anything that triggers on combat damage. So I'm using it here. I have never heard that term before. I haven't either, but I saw it. It's in their like tagger function. Uh Uh-huh. And they were like, these are your saboteurs. Your saboteurs. And I was like, oh. I like it though. I feel like you know, like you could be like, he's a he's a saboteur. Yeah, so this going in there and blowing things up. Getting getting in the works. Uh, That's that's straight up criminal, that is. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) There's 15 saboteurs in the deck. So that's things that would be doubled by Felix, basically. Yeah. Um, This could include equipment. This could be enchantments that are triggered by creatures dealing combat damage or creatures themselves that deal the damage and are triggered. And then, of course, we need the creatures to deal that combat damage. We do. We need somebody to be able to get in. There are 22 evasive attackers to trigger Gonti's second ability. That's pretty nice. That's pretty good. I mean, 22 is a little bit lower than what I'd want. I'd probably I'd probably want to add three or four to that. I, I would and will put yeah, more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the 15 saboteurs, I think, is a little low to run Felix in the command zone, unless you're going to do a more serious overhaul. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel like with Felix, you want like pretty much every creature you play and all the enchantments and stuff to like be doing saboteurs and right. stuff. Right. Like if we were doing this upgrade for Felix, we would take 10 theft spells out and put in 10 saboteur effects. Yeah. Uh, and that would get you in a decent direction for Felix. But this deck is clearly built around Gonti out of the box. We have the evasive attackers. We have uh, lots of ways to cast your opponent's spells. So we are going to go with that. Uh, all right. We've talked about the, the mechanics kind of generally. We like to take a closer look at the deck by looking at the best cards that show you exactly what the deck wants to do. And this first one is a favorite of yours, so I will let you introduce it. Uh, yes, this is, this is one of my favorite cards in all of Magic. Uh, villainous Wealth. <laughs> if, if this deck had been made and didn't have Villainous Wealth in it, it would have been... This deck should have been named Villainous Wealth. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, come on, guys, just name it that. <laughs> Uh, Villainous Wealth is X black, green, blue, Sultai, uh, for a sorcery, and it says target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. You may cast any number of spells with mana value X or less from among them without paying their mana costs. Sweet. I love this spell. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about this is you love this spell. You also love Genesis Wave, yeah, which you, is just <laughs> Villainous Wealth for me. <laughs> I just have a type. <laughs> I like big, crazy X spells yeah. that 
probably win the game. They give you those bananas board state. But you don't quite know how it's going to work out. And I feel like Villainous Wealth just leads to games you never expect. Like you I do agree. crazy stuff from it. I... The, here's you, you, I have a villainous yeah. wealth, wealth story. This is so I used to have a seven dwarves deck, uh, which the seven dwarves get better the more seven dwarves you have. Uh-huh. And I cast a dwarven recruiter, which tutors a bunch of dwarves to the top of your library. Uh-huh. So I cast a dwarven recruiter <laughs> and I put seven dwarves on top of my library. And the very next turn, my opponent villainous wealth me for like eight. <laughs> Stole all of my seven doors, put them all onto the battlefield. They're all like nine nines. They're the only person to date that has controlled every single seven dwarf in the deck. That's fantastic. It is so good. I was like, ah, my doors. You have a wealth of dwarves. It turns out they, they lured the dwarves over. I know. With the promise of wealth. I should have played around villain as well. <laughs> <laughs> that really is fantastic. They have the mines. They don't need all the wealth. Yeah. Uh, Villainous wealth, obviously great in this deck. It's going to give you a ton of your opponent's creatures or spells all at the same time. And you have some cool payoffs for doing that. But also it just gets you a ton of stuff. Yeah. This so. next one I feel like is also just like a classic commander theft card. I love yeah, this card. I think this card does everything the deck wants to yeah. do. It's Thief of Sanity. It's one blue black for a 2-2 flying specter. Whenever Thief of Sanity deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of that opponent's, or excuse me, of that player's library. Exile one of them face down, then put the rest into their graveyard. You may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and mana of any type can be spent to cast the spell. So this is a evasive attacker yeah. with a combat damage trigger that steals their stuff and puts other stuff into the graveyard. I consider Thief of Sanity, like even in non-theft decks, oh pretty much God. all the time. If it's you've one of my black, favorite cards to have on the battlefield. It's so good. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you get to look at the top three, pick the best one among it, and then just save it for whenever you need it later. It doesn't matter if the thief mm. is still around. Um, I, I think this deck, this card, it just puts in all of the work you need it to. Uh, the deck... We mentioned that there's a lot of ways to cast your opponent's spells. There's a yeah. couple of ways that cast them specifically from the graveyard, but the deck doesn't have a lot of mill to get stuff in there. Um, so Thief of Sanity is even doing work on that access. If you're holding something like a Diluvian Primordial, which only casts instants and sorceries from opponent's graveyards, yeah. it's going to be really hard to fuel that without any additional mill uh so it's even doing work on that axis absolutely we wanted to mention a new card and this is a doozy i i love this card uh this is thieving varmint uh this is one in a black for a 2-1 creature varmint with death dutch and lifelink and then it has tap pay one life add two mana of any one color spin this mana only to cast spells you don't own speaking of doing it all yeah this is like if you have this in your opening hand in this deck, mm-hmm. you know your game is about to go quite well. Yeah, I mean, this is an evasive attacker for the turn that Gonti comes down. If you yeah. don't have any spells. it's not technically evasive, but yeah. people aren't going to block this 2-1. Nobody's trading with a death touch varmint. Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you have Gonti on the battlefield and you don't have any spells of your opponents to cast, you can just attack yeah. with this thing and assume that they're not going to trade their commander for it. Um, if you do have spells to cast, this is a two mana dork that taps for two mana. That's so nice. That's the really life powerful. doesn't matter at all. No. It's like, eh, one life. W- one thing I love about this is like mm-hmm. a choice for one of the best cards in the deck is that this is definitely not a great card in a lot of decks. Yes. Um, this is a very narrow, narrow effect, but it is very, very powerful it's in decks so like this. so good right here. The other thing that we, we're going to talk about a little bit later is it's a death toucher. So in addition to being an evasive attacker, it's also just a really nice blocker. Yeah. Theft decks can kind of set off alarm bells in casual circles, Absolutely. even if you're stealing from the top of their library because they're, you know, sort of reminiscent of mill. People don't like their stuff stolen. They don't like it. Uh, so they are going to attack you. And if you have a little varmint around, it's a lot more difficult to attack you. Yeah. If you're the thieving varmint, then you want thieving varmint on your side. Exactly. Thieving varmints unite. (laughs) (laughs) Solidarity. All right. So that being said, we've we've talked about the stats and we a little bit of what we need to upgrade here. But I want to talk about the goals of this upgrade before we get into specific cards, because there are some real changes we wanted to make. Yeah. 
Uh, we picked Gonti as the commander. It just made sense. Uh, yeah. We already kind of went over some of our reasons mm. for it. And Gonti's just a fun character who, and this seems like a really fun play pattern. So, yeah. Gonti's I, a choice. Beloved character, Gonti, now in a cowboy hat. How can mm-hmm. you not be excited? Yeah. Uh, we mentioned that we've got a lot of ways to draw our opponent's cards, but it is going to be necessary for you to draw your own cards uh, to so you don't get blown out by a board wipe if you need more evasive attackers. Um, so you don't get blown out by a removal spell and have no way to continue the plan. There's just a lot of ways things go wrong if you don't have card draw. And it, it doesn't even change. It doesn't change because you have your opponent's cards. Yeah, I mean, an opponent's card, especially these days, with decks being so, so narrow. Yeah. Stealing an opponent's card isn't worth a full card in your deck. It's like half to a third of a card most of the time. Yeah, so even if you impulse draw like six of your opponent's cards, only maybe one or two of those are going to be useful to you, and you may not be able to even play the land depending on what way, yeah. like what theft spell you have. Um, you're going to be drawing lands. You're going to be drawing just their like, you know, ver- like, like if you were in another deck and you got someone's thieving varmint, like, what am I supposed to do? It's not going to work well It's just a 2-1 death touch lifelink. And magic is more and more specific cards built for your commander, right. built for your, like, setup. Like, I, I think a, a, a good example we've talked about is um, Jimmy Block, the other mm-hmm. writer here in the office, has a, a Danny Pink deck. Yeah, And yes. the deck is tough. It's so powerful. But... But it's full of trash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll have like one of the Frexia all be one cards tapping at an oil counter. And you're like, just like, why? What? <laughs> and it draws him like nine cards. But it won't draw you anything because yeah. you don't have Danny Pink. That's why you need your own card draw. Yes. You got to have uh, ways to draw your own stuff. Um, we wanted to lower the curve a little bit. There is some very, very expensive spells in this, uh, in addition to some big X spells. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of the ramp is in here. That's great. But we still need to be able to uh, cast yeah. multiple spells underneath Gonti so that when Gonti comes down, you can attack right Because Gonti is not ramping you on the cards that you have from your deck. So right. you got to get rid of some of the big ones. We also wanted to add like a couple payoffs for when you cast an opponent's spell. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, just be getting a little more value out of it instead of just the spell itself. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to consider when you're stealing your opponent's stuff. Um, We wanted to make sure that we were maximizing the the synergy in this deck because you're not going to have a lot of synergy with your opponent's cards. So making sure that you're maximizing the use of Gonti's like um, cost reduction effect. Mm -hmm. The more spells you can cast, the more powerful the cost reduction is. So you want to make sure that you're really feeding that engine and getting full use out of your five mana commander. Okay. Uh, those are the goals that we're, we had when we were adding 10 cards to this deck to make sure it is in the best fighting shape for your next game night. We are going to get into what exactly we added to this deck to get it there in just a few moments. Welcome one and all to Honest Rut Scenes Wild West Shopatorium. We've got keychains, novelty hot sauce, reanimated skeletons, you name it, we've got it. Yes, sir. Ever since I was relocated to Thunder Junction, business has been booming. But it's not just the change of scenery. I also got Shopify the global commerce platform that helped me grow my business every step of the way. Back in Innistrad, I had to hawk my tiny skulls out of my creepy trench coat all by myself. But that was the old Rutstein. Now, Shopify makes everything so much easier. Shopify lets me sell my wares everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Plus, they got great customer service and the internet's best converting checkout, helping you turn window shoppers into window buyers, if you sell windows, which I do. Now, thanks to Shopify, people don't call me Old Rutstein the Grave Robber, they call me Honest Rutstein Entrepreneur. Though I do still rob graves, my man's gotta have a hobby. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tcz, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash tcz now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash tcz. So, I win the game. And cut! Alright, reset, back to one. Checking the game. 
How do I keep up with everything going on here at the command zone? In my doer jeans, of course. Places, places. These jeans are so comfortable, I gotta be on the move to show them off right, like this. What are we running from? Yeah, we'll figure it out in post. Nice jeans. Nice jeans. Now, Magic players know the importance of staples, and a good pair of jeans are a staple part of any wardrobe. Jackets for your next scene. Doer denim, it's flexible. Like soaring, it can go anywhere. Plus, with its breathability and temperature regulation, it's gonna have you feeling fresh. So you're equipped for anything, from the battlefield to the boardroom. All right, team. How are those Q4 projections coming along? Our future positionings feel as comfortable as those jeans. Mana curves are down, winds are up. What if we were to leverage our core competencies by synergizing with our point of sale? Let's run it up the flagpole. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Because here at the command zone, we're not just talkers, we're doers. Optimize your legs with doer jeans. Upgrade your wardrobe and order your own pair of doer jeans today. Check out doer's flagship stores in LA or Denver or shop online at shopdoer.com slash command. Right now, our listeners can get 20% off site-wide when you use our special URL. Shopdoer.com slash command. This is an awesome deal. Don't wait to get 20% off. Go now to shopdoer.com slash command. Oh gosh, the Thunder Junction Jamboree is right around the corner, and I'm supposed to bring everyone presents. Now when it comes to gifting, your old pal Fibblethip is, unsurprisingly, totally lost. Or at least I was, before I stumbled across Gift Mode on Etsy. It made finding the perfect gift so easy, I almost didn't believe my eye. Just tap or click Gift Mode on Etsy, and answer a few quick questions about who you're shopping for. Then, it instantly points you in the right direction, with curated suggestions based on hundreds of personas. For the beauty guru Ariette, an enchanting personalized hand mirror. For the fitness fanatic Jolene, a custom gym bag she'll treasure forever. And for my favorite foodie, the Gitrog, a curated spice blend to help those arms and legs go down easier. Look, we all know how stressful gifting can be. Will they like what I got? Do they already have it? Which way is the store? Oh god, where am I? But with the independent sellers on Etsy, you can bring the wow factor with a personal touch. So remember, when you're plotting to surprise someone special with a present they'll love, gift mode has you covered. Now, the jamboree should be just around this... Wait, how did I get to Amonkhet? Not again! Need to find the perfect gift? Don't panic. Try gift mode on Etsy now. You browsing for some new tech? Yeah, I'm building Team Out and Architect. Ooh, how about Zergo and Ojitai? Did you just drag and drop that card image directly into your deck? Yep, with Architect, you can drag and drop card images from EDH Rec or Scryfall directly into the deck list. No typing required. That is so cool. Ooh, okay, check this out. I'm gonna drag and drop Dragon Storm into the deck, and then boom, I'm gonna drop a bunch of dragons on the battlefield. A nine drop, huh? Seems ambitious. It was just for the pun. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back, everybody. We are finally going to get into the specifics of this deck upgrade. We're going to tell you what 10 cards to add to the Grand Larceny Precon to get it in fighting shape. We're going to use a budget of $50, so the total... Uh, value will be all under $50 and you can buy it all. It'll be all under $100 with your pre-con. Or a budget of free if you or, steal all There the you go. Don't do that. Don't steal them. Don't steal cards. Unless. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal cards. Don't steal cards. Buy them from cardkingdom.com slash yeah. command. Um, all right. This this first section is about casting your opponent's spells and even a little bit of payoff. Yeah, and get, getting some stuff for it. Yeah. Let's meet this first lady. The first edition I wanted to put in the deck is Tasha the Witch Queen uh, from Dungeons and Dragons. And she is three blue and a black for a four loyalty planeswalker, uh, Tasha. And then... She has the passive ability of whenever you cast a spell you don't own, create a 3-3 three, three black demon creature token. Sick. Yeah, that's and perfect. that's really like why she's in. Right. She's being put in because then it just turns everything you're pulling from someone else into a 3-3, three, three, which adds up real quick. That's a great payoff, and it's on an efficient permanent. Yeah. And then her loyalty abilities are she can tick up for one and draw a card for each opponent, exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from that player's graveyard, and put a page counter on it. Mm-hmm. And then, for minus three, you may pl you may cast a spell from among cards in exile with page counters on them without paying its mana cost. Nice. Um, now, as we kind of mentioned earlier, you don't really have a ton of ways to put stuff into the graveyard yeah. uh, for Tasha. So, you know, we might do a little bit of that uh, going on. But really, just Tasha's uh, ability that's already on there just fits so well with the deck. 
It's a great static ability, plus the plus one just draws you a card, even if you don't have instants and sorceries to hit, which you'll probably have one incidentally. Yeah. Uh, it just draws you a card, and then it could steal cards in the later game. Meanwhile, you're making three threes as long as your plan is online. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tasha's doing a lot for this deck, um, so she's worth the $4.50 to pick her up. The next card I couldn't believe wasn't in the deck. I guess it's just such a recent card. Yeah, that, that maybe they it, just like... Yeah, it's a it's a 50 cent card from Murders at Karlov Manor. It is outrageous robbery. What's outrageous? This is an outrageous robbery. How dare you rob me that like that? Robbery, eh, that robbery, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a fine robbery. <laughs> but that one? Outrageous. Outrageous. <laughs> this is a X black black for an instant. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. This is like a super efficient super Gandhi. This is just a super efficient draw spell. I mean, like it, Black Black X at instant speed can draw you three, four cards, no problem. Yeah, I I think that this card could be a really huge swing for you. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, Gandhi is going to be like reducing the cost on all of those cards that you cast. And Gandhi's a cost reducer. Right. Which, you know, if you haven't played with those before, is really good ramp. Like, yeah. if you cast a couple spells in a turn off of this outrageous robbery, you're getting a ton of value out of it. I, I really like this card in the deck. Plus, you could just say, this is an outrageous robbery! Outrageous! <laughs> The next thing that we promised we were going to add to this deck is evasive attackers, specifically ones that you can cast before Gonti hits the battlefield so that when Gonti shows up, you've got something to attack with. Yes. And this first one uh, I thought was a really good fit. Perfect. It's Fada Adele, Aquisitor. And you might not have noticed, but Gonti is a canny Aquisitor. And she's an Aquisitor. Aquisitor typo? Yo, Aquisitors! Your deck's out there Aquisiting. Let's read what she does. Thought <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adele Aquisitor is one blue blue for a 2-2 two, two legendary creature, Merfolk Rogue, with Island Walk. Whenever Thought Adele Aquisitor deals combat damage to a player, search that player's library for an artifact card and exile it. Then that player shuffles his or her library until end of turn. You may play that card. Slick. Uh, Thought of Adele is a very powerful magic card sitting at $11.25, but boy, does she do it all in this deck. She is just like a perfect synergy with Gonti. She gets in, she gets the card from Gonti, she gets to look through their deck and get an artifact. And in Commander, most decks have at least one pretty notable artifact. Swole Ring. She is real good at stealing Soul Ring. She loves them. And if you have Gonti out, that's like a free Soul Ring you're casting. It is. I mean, I just love this curve. Right, you yeah. play uh, like you ramp on two. You play Thada Adele on three. You play Gonti on four. Attack with Thada Adele. So you've tapped out at this point. You yeah. have no mana up, but you attack with Thada Adele. You trigger Gonti. You trigger Thada Adele. You get the Soul Ring. Gonti makes the Soul Ring free. Cast a Soul Ring and like do the Gonti theft steal it thing. It seems so good. That's wild. Yeah. That's such a like that's such a great start to the game. And if no one does something about Thada Adele, there's a really good chance you're gonna get another soul ring. Another next one. <laughs> Sometimes there's only one player with islands and you just keep picking off their signets, and that's fun too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, there are more and more good artifacts entering Commander yeah. all the time. Like, I feel like artifacts have been a theme in a ton of sets that have come out recently. So I think Thought Adele's just going to get better. Yeah, start picking up some equipment. There's lots and lots of powerful, like, get some Swift Foot boots from somebody is very powerful. Oh, yeah. Um, up next is one of the most powerful cards they've printed in the last few years, but also has some very, very sick synergy in this deck. It's Douthy Voidwalker. Sitting at $14, Douthy Voidwalker is a two-mana Douthy Rogue. It's black-black for a 3-2 with Shadow. So Shadow says this creature can block or be blocked by only creatures with Shadow. So that means unless your opponent has a creature with Shadow, they can't block. And Douthy is also not doing much blocking. Yeah, but you don't want him to block. No. It also says, if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, instead exile it with a void counter on it. And you can sacrifice Douthy and choose an exiled card an opponent owns with a void counter on it, and you may play it this turn without paying its mana cost. Wow. Okay. 
so I, normally when we're doing these upgrades, like, yes. you know, we want to focus on synergy and stuff. We don't just want to jam in generically good staples. But <laughs> Dothy Voidwalk is a generically good staple. It is. it is. But he is so on plan for this deck. This is an evasive attacker that yep. specifically steals your opponent's spells. Yeah. And this is something I thought was really cool mm -hmm. about it. Because when you're casting your opponent's spells, when you're casting like their removal spells and that kind mm -hmm. of thing, it's going to their graveyard. And it's going right under Dothy Voidwalk. Very clever. So you get to use it twice. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I could totally see there being a turn where you, like, steal a Swords to Plowshares for some, from mm -hmm. someone. And you're like, cool, I'll Swords that. Uh, that will go to your graveyard, go under Dothy Voidwalker. I will tap and sacrifice Dothy Voidwalker. I will cast that Swords to Plowshares again. Like, that's a really powerful setup. That's a setup. huge swing. I I think this card is great in the deck. Obviously, Douthy is very powerful generically, but when there's this much synergy, it's so worth picking yeah. it up. Plus, then you just have a Douthy later if you want to build a more powerful black deck. You'll never regret having a Douthy Voidwalker. It's just such a good card. Uh, this next one is sweet. I'm so excited that this is in the upgrade. Yeah, you you pointed out how well this works uh, to me, and I thought it was very, very clever. Um, and I like it. This is Cephalid Facetaker, uh, which is two and a blue for a 1-4 creature Cephalid Rogue, and Cephalid Facetaker can't be blocked. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may have Cephalid Facetaker become a copy of another target creature until end of turn, except it's a 1-4 and has this creature can't be blocked. Uh... What you pointed out that mm -hmm. I thought was just brilliant here mm -hmm. is that you are stealing stuff from your opponent's decks and what you are often missing, the thing you can't steal and is not going to make the synergy work, is their commander. Yeah. But with Cephalid Facetaker, you can just turn it into your opponent's commander. Yeah, I. there's so much to love here because now all of the useless cards that you're getting off of your opponent's deck has some synergy because yes. you have a copy of their commander. And Cephalid Facetaker doesn't even stay a copy of their commander. You could switch it to a different player's commander if you start casting stuff off of their library. So cool. Not to mention it's an evasive attacker that comes down before Gonti and just costs 75 cents. <laughs> it's... I... I I think it's just an amazing include in the deck. It's yeah. going to get you so much value. When you have Cephalid Facetaker out, it's not going to feel worth removing to mm -hmm. people because it's just chipping in and getting one damage to them, but it is going to like make your engine work. Yeah. I, I really like it in this deck. I'm, I'm actually surprised this isn't in the 99. This feels like exactly the kind of card that they would include here. Yeah. Uh, but pick one up for yourself. Um, this next section is saboteurs. Saboteurs. We do want to up some of the synergy with Felix. Make sure that you're getting as much value as you can when you're dealing all this combat damage. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, speaking of not in the deck, but should be, the first one is Grim Hireling. Cool. Uh, Grim Hireling is a $10 card right now, but it is very, very powerful. Absolutely worth it. Three and a black for a tiefling rogue. It's a 3-2. It says, whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. Then black, sacrifice X treasures. Target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So you're not going to use the second ability as much, but sometimes it really yeah. pays in just to pick off an Esper Sentinel or something. You've got it there. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, at times where you're like, it doesn't matter how much treasure I have. I need that to be gone. I need that dead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But in the meantime, you're already trying to deal combat damage to three different players so you can trigger your commander as many times. So Grim Hireling is a natural fit that just gives you five color mana. Yeah. Because th that's something we haven't mentioned yet. Most of the stuff does say that you can cast it, you know, with any color, mm -hmm. but not everything. And also, you know, if you go into especially some of the older and like deeper theft cards in mm -hmm. Magic, they're not always going to give you that, you know, the any fixing color line thing. of text. Yeah. That, that lets you cast spells for using mana of any color. Not to mention, you're, you might steal you know, someone's creature that has an activated ability that's mm -hmm. like red, deal damage to something. Yeah, these treasures are going to come in clutch to make sure that you can use all of the cards that actually show up on your board. Yep. Uh, Grim Hireling is going to be a great ad for you. Up next, we have... Plus five boots just loves them. Now uh, when you hit, yeah. you get four treasures. Gross. Uh, five boots and four treasures. <laughs> Uh, like, I keep a treasure in each boot, except yeah. that one. That's my <laughs> knife. <laughs> Next up, we have the Indomitable. 
Uh, this is two blue blue for a 6-6 six, six legendary artifact vehicle uh, with trample. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Then it has crew three, and you may cast the indomitable from your graveyard as long as you control three or more tapped pirates and or vehicles. I'm going to be honest. Probably not going to happen. I don't expect <laughs> to cast this from the graveyard. In this Unless deck you're playing off. against a vehicle deck. And you're stealing all their vehicles. Yeah, or a pirate deck. And stealing all their pirates. If you steal Serves enough them right. If you steal enough pirates with the Indomitable to bring the Indom or if you steal enough pirates with this deck to bring the Indomitable back from the graveyard, oh. that would be a dream. <laughs> yeah, I mean there's a lot of upside to the Indomitable over something like um the well, one with cycling. Yeah, we talked about reconnaissance mission. Reconnaissance mission or even, you know, Biden of Thassa. Coastal piracy. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that have this sort of effect. Mm -hmm. But honestly, it's like the Indomitable is new. Um it's not very expensive. It's also a 6-6 six, six with trample. Yeah. Like your commander can crew this thing, and Gonti has no natural evasion. So if you use Gonti to crew the Indomitable, attack, deal some amount of damage. It's got trample, so you're probably drawing a card off of it and triggering Gonti at least once. Yeah, I mean, Commander's not a game where it's all just about having, you know, big stompy creatures, mm -hmm. but a 6-6 six, six is a real threat. That's especially big. with like curves getting lower and mm -hmm. stuff like that. No one's going to, like, block this with their Esper Sentinel. Or it is so funny that it has Trample. Yeah. That the, I guess it can't, It can't. it's indomitable. Well, I kind of imagine someone's, you can't like, stop me. standing in front of the boat being like, stop! <laughs> they're like, no, and I'm then, a boat! <laughs> but then all boats should have Trample. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, but not all boats are as emphatic about that's how boat-like they that's are. I'm a boat! <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think there's some serious upsides to the indomitable in this deck. Uh, up next is another little saboteur. Uh, it's Toski, Bearer of Secrets. Oh, your buddy. My buddy. Three and a green for a squirrel. It says, this spell can't be countered. It's indestructible. Toski attacks each combat if able, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Nice little card draw engine. You're already trying to deal combat damage, and Toski's a body that can wear some of these equipment, and, you know... Probably isn't getting through, but gives you another attacker. Yeah, and you know, there's going to be times where Toski gets through and yeah. gets you some cards, but you have plenty of things which will get through. He's just a solid little dude to have. Yeah, it also pairs well with just all the evasive creatures that are mm -hmm. in the deck. Uh, Toski's sitting at $4. Not bad. Finally, we've added some card draw, but we wanted to make sure that we've got plenty in the deck so that you're fueling your own engine. Uh, and a little bit of mill along the way. Yeah, so we tried to do add a couple pieces of card draw that felt like they had some like synergy mm. with the deck. Um, the first one is uh, always pretty good. It's yeah. Windfall. Currently sitting at $3. Uh, basically, Windfall is just two and a blue for a sorcery, and each player discards their hand, then draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards a player discarded this way. Windfall is... Super nice in this mm -hmm. deck for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it fills people's graveyards for like your Tasha, for things that are actually mm -hmm. getting stuff from the graveyard. I think another thing that's like a, a little bit of a low key, really powerful move mm -hmm. with this windfall is that when you're exiling this stuff with Gonti, that's not going in your hand. You are just like building up this exile hand of special Gonti cards. Mm -hmm. So you're not losing nearly as much as everyone else right. with this card because your card draw engine is untouchable by Windfall. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a big thing that people inherently know about Windfall but don't necessarily um, like clearly know yeah. is when you're going to cast a Windfall, it's three mana, so you can cast as much out of your hand as possible and yeah. save those cards in exile with Gonti for a later turn. So if you can dump as much of your hand onto the battlefield, we know you have 16 pieces of ramp in the deck. Um, we tried to make the attackers a little bit more efficient. Dump your hand. Just get it out there. Then you'll draw the maximum amount of, amount of cards at the table and have kept some cards in reserve in exile. Yeah, you'll have all those Gonti cards still ready to play. And fueled up the graveyard. Yeah. Uh, finally, this is one that that you thought of, and I think it's great. It's Extraordinary Journey. It's XX Blue Blue for an enchantment. When Extraordinary Journey enters the battlefield, exile up to X target creatures. For each of those cards, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. Okay, so it's like a funky little bounce spell. Yeah. But then it says, whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. 
I think that this is super cool. Yeah. Because, I mean, you can definitely use it as a, like, tempo removal sort of spell. Yep, it's great for that. Having to recast the cards can be pretty backbreaking. I agree. I think bounce spells are so underrated in Commander right now. Well, and these are bounce spells that are also giving you a card when yep. they play it again. Mm -hmm. Like, that can add up really quick. And then... Even if you're not bouncing their stuff and getting the cards, mm -hmm. you're going to be casting their creatures on From your exile. turn. From exile. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to have flash creatures and stuff if you want to get something <laughs> on their turns, mm -hmm. but you're still probably going to be getting a card from this every turn. I could right. see there being scenarios where you just cast this for blue, blue, mm -hmm. and just use it as a way to be getting cards every time you're casting their creatures. Absolutely. I mean... I think this is just going to be a quiet little draw engine for you, which is yep. really good in decks like this. You don't need it to draw a million cards. You need it to draw some so that when you're casting your opponent's spells from exile, you're getting a little bit of your own cards back as well. Um, I think this is exactly the kind of card draw that the deck really wants, which is just keep your hand a little bit full so in case things go wrong, you have another plan in your hand. Yeah, you have enough time to rebuild your engine a little bit. So I love this upgrade. I think this went really, really well. And then I looked at the total for this upgrade and was like, wow, did you do it? The total value for this upgrade is $49.50. Right on the money. Yeah. yeah. Take that 50 cents for yourself. Tip your tip your deck builder. <laughs> <laughs> tip your deck builder. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. us. <laughs> you can send that 50 cents right in the mail. Uh, <laughs> no, use it to get a foil or something. Yeah. Um, so those are the 10 cards that we're adding. I think we did a good job lowering the curve, giving you some more creatures, giving you some more synergy, and uh, even making the deck a little bit more explosive as well. Now, I have to say, when, mm -hmm. when I was when I first saw the commander before looking at the deck list, yeah. I immediately went and like made a list of cards, and I was like, "Oh, I want to add these." Mm -hmm. And I was impressed at how many of those cards were already in the deck. I agree; it's a very well built deck. It's got a lot of the cards that you would expect already, which is exactly what I look for in a precon. I think yeah. more than value for me, if I'm buying a a precon, it means I'm building this deck. And yeah. I want just a ton of the pieces in one spot. I want it to have the experience already sort of like built in. Right. Yeah. And I think it's cool when all the Zet symbols match. Yeah. Because I'm a loon that way. Um, but then, of course... We have to take 10 cards out. Um, there are some sort of extraneous cards in here. We're trying to lower the curve, so we're going to try and cut some of the top end here. But first, we get to cut a card that I really don't care for. Let's get it out. It's Cunning Rhetoric. Hey, not very cunning. Yeah, this is like when opponents attack you, you get the top card of their library, which is good in a deck that wants to cast your opponent's spells. But if they don't want to give you the top card of their library, they're just not going to attack you, which I guess is fine. This is... So play aroundable. It's You're just not, not in control of your own destiny with this. And what it what it just does is it makes people go like, okay, well, when I hit you, I want to make it hurt. I'm gonna hit you with everything I have, <laughs> right? Because it's yeah, with one or more. Whenever an opponent attacks you, yeah, yeah, it, you're only getting one, no matter how many creatures they attack you. It's going to stop them from coming in for chip damage, yeah. but they're still going to be like, well... All right, I'll send six at you, then. I want to make sure I'm wrecking you if I'm going to give you a card. It's got to be worth more than you stealing one of my cards. I think this card flags more threat than it is, which is the worst kind of card in Commander. Yeah. It's like a card that isn't very good, but makes your opponents concerned. The the, the first upgrade I did on um, Command Zone was mm -hmm. for the, the Brina Strixhaven deck, yeah. and I think this card was was originally printed in that. I believe so. And yeah. I didn't cut it from the deck and I had it in the deck for a long time and I played it. And after a while I was just like, man, even in this deck, which is like trying to stop people from attacking you, this card is terrible. It, it doesn't, doesn't feel that do good. anything. Yeah. I, I, don't like I, I don't love it. And this is like sort of the best scenario I can imagine. Yeah. But still don't love it. Next, next card. Next card to cut is Chaos Wand. Uh, this is three of any color for an artifact which has four and tap. Target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until you exile an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way, cast this way on the bottom of that library in a random order. Mm -hmm. um, card's not very good. Yeah, Chaos Wand has gotten a lot worse well with when the decks got more and more narrow. You're just going to hit stuff that isn't good for you. You are a spending lot. seven mana, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in installments, it's true, to get one basically at random instant mm -hmm. or sorcery from someone's deck. A lot of times you're just going to like 
hit someone's ramp spell or or you know. like even worse you just hit the her- heroic intervention at the wrong time or you yeah. hit a board wipe at the wrong time or you hit an x spell and it does nothing i i I had a deck that had both Chaos Wand and Wand of Wonder, which I actually do like a lot. Wand of Wonder de- at least gives you some options. Yeah, and I ended up cutting Chaos Wand because I just kept hitting like destroy all non-token creatures, and you're like, all oh, my uh, that's my that would be very good for my opponent who yep. I just stole it from. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's just not as as good anymore. You don't have any control. It doesn't have any real synergy with Gonti, Mm-mm. so I, I'm I'm not a fan. Uh, this next one is actually one of my favorite cards in the deck, but I agree it is a little <laughs> bizarre here. It's Thieving Amalgam. I, I had to fight Rachel to take this one out of the deck. Yeah, he's a payoff, sort of. <laughs> he's a seven mana ape snake. At the beginning of each turn, you manifest, or uh, each of your opponent's turns, you manifest the top card of their library. But it also says whenever a creature you control but don't own dies, its owner loses two life and you gain two life. It's a nice little payoff for having your opponent's stuff. The problem is... How do you make them die? Yeah. You don't have a way to, like, sacrifice the creatures. You don't have any way to, like, get extra triggers off of this or anything. You I, don't I know even they, have a great way of getting it into play. It's I know a seven-mana creature. You play this in, like, reanimator decks. Yes, yeah. Stuff. I have this in a reanimator deck. I built a reanimator deck, honestly, around it. I think it's a really fun card to have, and, and it's such a problem in a box. I've seen it come out really early on the other side of the battlefield and been like, man, it's making a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when you're when you're paying the full price for it, it's going to annoy people. It's mm-hmm. just going to make you two twos and they're going to kill it before they kill your stuff and yeah. get you the payoff from it. The, the Thieving Amalgam definitely has the cunning rhetoric problem where if it, it's scarier than it is mm-hmm. <laughs> because it is a very slow engine, but not great in this deck. The next card we decided to cut is Silent Blade Oni. This is three blue, blue, black, black for a creature demon ninja. It is a 6-5 with ninjutsu for blue, black. Uh, And whenever Silent Blade Oni deals combat damage to a player, look at that player's hand. You may cast a spell from among those cards without paying its mana cost. Um, this is a powerful effect, and mm-hmm. there is you know support for ninjutsu type stuff in the deck. I think that this just like is expensive even when it's being ninjutsued and is like not quite enough for what its payoff is. Yeah, Silent Blade Oni is tricky. I I think this is a really powerful ninja in ninja decks where you're designed to have like one mana evasive creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually with ETBs, like they'll come in and tap something and attack or they'll come in and scry. And, And when you're only bouncing a one mana creature to your hand, this cost feels very doable and it's very powerful. Yeah. But this deck is sort of full of three mana evasive creatures that have like combat damage triggers. Like bouncing your your thieving, your not thieving skydiver, that's actually good. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is the blue black one, Thief of Sanity. Yeah. Like bouncing your Thief of Sanity for this thing is like, well, I'm down a Thief of Sanity trigger, I have to recast Thief of Sanity, and I have to hope that there's something in their hand I want to cast. Yeah, a, a lot of the time, you would rather have that creature continue to be able to do that damage every yeah. turn and keep getting in and getting you cards with Gonti instead of getting one free spell from their hand, mm. which, I, I mean, I have my, my theft deck I play most of the time, steals stuff from people's hands, and I don't think you can reliably get great cards from people's hands unless mm. you have a way to put more cards there a lot of the time. Right. So I, I just don't think it's a great fit in this deck. Uh, the next one is Extract Brain. Blue Black X for a sorcery. Target opponent chooses X cards from their hand. Look at those cards. You may cast a spell from among them without paying its mana cost. So this has some similarities to Silent Blade Oni. Um, well, I, I look at this card... You don't get to see their whole hand. Yeah, they get to choose which cards you see. So you're definitely not getting their best card unless you pay yeah. enough mana to see their entire hand. Let's say they have four in their hand. Yeah. And you, so you have to pay six mana to see their whole hand. Yeah. And then when you cast something from their hand, you have to hope it's at least worth six mana. Yeah. Which is not easy. If they've got some crazy eight drop, wow, you got lucky. Then you did it. But if they don't, now you paid six mana to steal their, you know, uh mana rock or I, I just look at like outrageous robbery for you know a big X spell that's yeah. like getting you cards from someone else that would have else. drawn you four cards and just imagine how much more you can do with that than this yeah I say instead of extracting brain 
you extract this card from the deck. Uh Aha, but you do have to read the flavor text because it is, no thought is as succulent as a secret. Ho ho, I love the word succulent. Pretty fun, pretty fun. (laughs) This next one is a pretty easy cut. Uh, this I next one. threw this on the ground. Yeah. Get out of here. Shoo. <laughs> uh, this next card is Void Attendant. Uh, this is two and a green for a two, three creature Eldrazi processor. It is devoid, so it's not actually green. And then it has the activate ability for one and a green. Put a card an opponent owns from exile into that player's graveyard. Create a one, one colorless Eldrazi scion creature token. It has sacrifice this creature, add colorless. Mm-hmm. I get why they put this in the deck. It's cute. But it's too cute. It's too cute. This is them being like, oh, wow, this is somewhere we could put a void attendant. <laughs> There's gonna ha- they're going to have cards in exile, so you can put those cards back in exile and make spawns out of it. Pay five mana and make one spawn after doing the thing. But it's not even ramp. That's like, not even, no. It's colorless mana, too. You need, like, you need all the color mana. You need treasures. Th- this is like a way to, if you have a ton of extra mana on your turn, to make more mana to bank some of that for a future turn because it's not mana positive no you know you can spin two and get something that you can later sacrifice Mm. for one cute too cute yeah too cute i I feel like the way commander works these days Mm. you don't have a ton of extra mana that you are trying to save for later you want to use your mana there is like a super cool eldrazi in this deck that we should talk about Uh, oblivion sower is in this deck and this is cute but i think this is awesome (laughs) this is the one that it's like when you cast this spell target opponent exiles the top four cards of their library then you may put any number of land cards that player owns from exile onto the battlefield under your control You've been hopefully exiling a lot of cards. You can get like this could four, be huge. four or five lands off of this thing. I could see it being even more than that. I, depending on yeah how focused you've been on one player, you could really nail somebody with an Oblivion Sower. Yeah. And a Void Attendant just doesn't give you that same level of uh, explosiveness. No, I, I think I think that Oblivion Sower seems super funny. I like it a lot. Uh, Plasm Capture is the next card that we are casting. This is a four mana counter spell that gives you mana of any col- combination of colors where X is that spell's mana value on your next main phase. Um, this is a very, very expensive mana drain. It gives you colored mana, which is nice, but this really locks you into when you can cast your stuff and when you don't know what kind of spells you're getting, it just feels a little weird. I don't. I also don't think this is a hold up four mana deck. No, because it's you not super be, instant speed. Well, yeah, and, and you don't even know if the stuff you're getting from your opponent's decks are instant speed and stuff. You, you want to be spending mm. it and getting that stuff out and casting your spells. Yeah, I. There are plasm capture decks. There's definitely hold up all your mana and get people with big splashy counter spells. I don't think this one is one of them. Well, and so often when you want to counter spell something, it's like I'm trying to counter spell someone's, you know, path to exile mm-hmm. on my Gaunti, right. and nothing feels worse than spending four mana to counter a one mana removal or something. Yeah, I agree. Uh, up next, this card to cut is one of the value cards, Mind's Dilation. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is five blue blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts their first spell each turn, that player exiles the top card of their library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Um, this card is fun, mm-hmm. and I know there will be, probably be people who are upset about casting this because it. I know it's kind of can be some people's pet cards. I mm-hmm. just don't think it's very good. I don't love these, like, seven mana cross your fingers enchantments. Yeah. Um, Like, we have Villainous Wealth, which is, like, if you pay seven mana, you cast five spells. Yeah. This is seven mana after two rotations with your seven mana enchantment. Hopefully, you've cast six. And this can miss. Yeah. This can miss hard. All it has to be is a land on top. And then you're like, well... Get hopefully I'll have something next turn. Also, Darn like it. you're spending seven mana to hopefully hit a lot of things, but it's a lot of things over a lot of time. It just isn't efficient enough, I think, unless you're really investing a lot of synergy in it. And the deck just isn't. Well, and it's super obvious. It mm. doesn't trick anybody. It sits there and people go, I guess we should deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah. Honestly, if I'm playing against a Mind Stilation these days, I'm like, go nuts. <laughs> All <laughs> I'm right. I'm not playing around it. You can have whatever random things on top of oh, my deck. You got my Cultivate. <laughs> yeah, like, it's yours. And it's free value, but you're getting to seven mana is a long time. Definitely. Uh, the next card, I you can see sort of an ooze sub-theme uh, 
sneaking, leaking out, I guess, <laughs> here uh, to go with Felix Five Boots. We've got Plasm Capture and then the Mimeoplasm. Uh, Mimeoplasm, when it enters the battlefield, you can exile two creature cards from graveyards. If you do, it enters the battlefield as a copy of one of those cards with a number of additional plus one counters on it equal to the power of the other card. This is a really sweet commander. Uh, usually has a lot of mill and a lot of big things that are cool to reanimate. This deck doesn't have many of those. It doesn't have a lot of self-mill. You're also not stealing anything. Yeah. You're not guaranteed that it's evasive. I just don't think the mini- Mimeoplasm does enough without putting in the extra synergy around it. So... If you want to include the Mimeoplasm, go build the Mimeoplasm because it yeah, he's rules. Great. He's really fun. But yeah, if you're in the Mimeoplasm, you want to have the creatures in your graveyard, you can pull back with it. Yeah, you just need the mill. Like, you're not guaranteed that your opponents yeah. are going to have, like, that. there's going to be two creatures in the graveyard at all, let alone two desirable creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, we, we want creatures that come down before Gonti, so when you hit, you can execute the plan. This is off plan. And too expensive. Yep. Speaking of too expensive. This next cut is personal. <laughs> uh, and it you is know what you did. Deluvian Primordial. You failed me one too many times, Deluvian Primordial. Now I gotta cut you. <laughs> um, this is five blue blue for a five five creature avatar flying when Deluvian Primordial enters the battlefield. For each opponent, you may cast up to one target instant or sorcery card from that player's graveyard without paying its mana cost. If a spell cast this way would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. This card misses all the time. All the time. I cannot say the number of games that I have had a Deluvian Primordial. Like, I had a Blink deck that I was mm-hmm. like, oh, this will be a great one. I can keep blinking it, and I, you know, I'll get free spells every yeah. turn. You run out of spells real fast. And there's nothing to cast off of this. Mm-hmm. I mean, your dream world is that you get some enormous crazy spell off of it, but realistically... Most of the enormous crazy spells are going to be board wipes. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you're not getting these, like, it, it's... Not very common for spells to have seven mana instants and sorceries anymore, unless they're specifically built around seven mana instants and sorceries, which you're just not going to play against that often. Yeah. So the likelihood that you're going to hit a big spell that isn't an X spell is low. I mean, if you want to play my Deluvian Primordial, put it in the Mimeoplasm. Dedicate your deck to, to milling. You have to fill their graveyards, or you're just not going to consistently get what you want. You've got to do the work here. Uh, Deluvian Primordial or Ganti doesn't do the work for you. Um in this deck, if there's a spell that you really want to hit in their graveyard with Deluvian Primordial, mm-hmm. that probably means that they cast that spell. Right. And it's too late. Things are going badly for It's you. already happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you like get a Genesis Ultimatum or something like that. Sure. Like, those spells are sweet, but... You try and get someone's expropriate, it's like, you ain't getting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... It's too late. They yeah. have three extra turns already. Uh, those are the cuts. We have 10 cards in. We got 10 cards out. We got a spicy new deck. We've lowered the curve. Got rid of it. The funny thing is I remember putting, marking Deluvian Primordial as evasive attacker <laughs> uh, in the stats. All right. Because you're like, technically it is. It does fly. Uh, but we put in some much better evasive attackers in the deck um, and... and <laughs> Cut some seven mana ones. Uh, now that those cuts have been made, let's talk about how the deck plays, um, how you anticipate this game plan being executed, and then maybe some tips on how to play a thefty deck. I mean, I think that the basic plan of this deck is pretty obvious. Mm. You want to get invasive creatures out and just be attacking your opponents every turn. I think ideally you want to be sending an evasive creature at each opponent each turn so right. you're getting the maximum stuff off of Gonti. But it could also make sense just to have a little more synergy of like really focusing on one person and trying to steal cards from them to like get stuff out of it. Yeah, if you only have one or two attackers, make sure you're hitting the same player re- players repeatedly. It'll make them annoyed, but it'll make the cards that you draw better because they work better together. And then I think once you have that, you know, attack engine and Gonti going on, you just want to be, you know, pushing that card advantage, using Mm -hmm. your commander to generate value, um, pay less for it, get spells out, and keep that going. This is an overwhelming value deck. You're trying to um, have more mana, have more cards, have more uh, board presence, and still keep a huge, like, hand of your own cards in reserve. You're making up for your inconsistency Mm -hmm. compared, like, with the cards you have Mm -hmm. by just having a lot of it. Yes, quantity over quality here. Um, We mentioned it a little bit, but theft decks are tricky to play these days, especially ones that are making you draw and cast their cards. That's a lot of work to put into cards that aren't necessarily on the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, So... 
again, it, it's just going to be it's going to be about choosing your shots and and casting the cards that you have access to. Remember that the anth the Gonti's cost reduction is very powerful. Um, the more you can use it, but a lot of the spells that you're going to be getting are not necessarily slam dunks. Which, part of the fun of a deck like this mm -hmm. is that you're looking for payoffs in your opponent's deck. Yeah. Like, you are, like, I think def decks like this are a really fun way to find lines that you've not had to do before. Absolutely. Because so often we build commander decks with a clear plan in mind, and that's a good idea. You want to mm -hmm. do that. But... A deck like this can be a really fun exercise in discovering a new plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like that a whole lot. Yeah, I um, we mentioned it, I think, but it's like only cast the number of attackers that you need. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't put more than three evasive attackers on the board at a time because mm -hmm. once you have three and they can reliably hit your opponents, you do not need to commit more creatures to the board for a, a board wipe unless you're trying to win with combat damage specifically. And then sometimes you just need to dump your hand and go for it. Yeah. Um, but you, you want to have stuff still in your hand so when the board gets wiped and stuff, yeah. you can reliably rebuild your little engine uh, going on there. Uh, I... Have a, I have a theft deck myself that I yeah. really enjoy, and one of the things I really like about it is... It's Zara. Zara, mm -hmm. Renegade Recruiter. Yes. Um, and what one of the f most fun things about it is you can bring it to a pod where you aren't really sure what the power level is going mm -hmm. to be. Theft decks adjust themselves to the pod really well. Mm -hmm. Because you're casting their spells. You know, if you are fi going against someone who just uh, wants to play crazy stompy creatures and mm -hmm. do stuff like that. So do you. You've got crazy stompy creatures. If you are playing with someone who has like, you know, a really tight, powerful, like tons of really mm -hmm. impactful spells and creatures and stuff, you've got it too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it's just really fun and adjustable. In that yeah. Sense. I, I just built a clone deck for the first time, and I think it's going to have a very similar play patterns to clone decks where you're trying to figure out what what's the best thing at the table and how to adjust to that. Um, the interesting thing about this deck is I don't think this strategy is extremely powerful. Um, theft strategies, taking stuff that they've already invested a card and mana on, is very powerful. Yeah. But this, you're spending a card to get their card and still have to cast their card. So... It's not it's not a super busted deck, but your opponents will probably perceive you as the problem. Yeah, because you, it, I think decks like like Gonti and like um the the like six mana Xanathar yeah decks get perceived as the big bad because it sits somewhere between like theft and mill, which is exactly where casual tables want to be the most mad. <laughs> well, everyone everyone also sees the theft cards. It's in the command zone. And, yeah. and, and they see w when you hit them and you steal their card mm -hmm. and you cast one of their good cards, they're like, I that wanted to cast could have been me. Yes. I could have cast that card. But yeah. you did it. And, and yeah, you're adding the combat damage thing, so you're literally hitting the table over and over to steal their cards. Um, so I do think that you're going to flag as the threat. And if you're playing this deck, lean into it. Yeah. It's a grand it. larceny deck, baby. Be know the bad guy. That you're the problem. Look at me. I'm a bad guy. You can tell because I'm smoking. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Don't smoke, kids. No. <laughs> Don't do it. It's bad. This is a fake pipe. Especially not out of plastic pipes. This is nope. all sort of carcinogens. I don't even think this can actually draw air through it. Don't. Don't smoke. Oh, it can. It's but, got a little hole. <laughs> but be the bad guy. Yeah. Because you're going to be perceived that way. Yeah. So know that you're going to have to protect your life total. Have some death touchy creatures like the thieving bar varmint back where it's like, hey, I know you're mad at me. But you can't attack me conveniently right now. And be careful about like what you're casting because yeah. people don't always adjust their threat assessment for decks like this. So if you cast a card that like screams combo that you got from someone else's deck, you ain't comboing with it. Yeah. But they're still going to look at it and go like, oh, I know that that's a threatening card. Yeah. I, I swear this has happened to me <laughs> many times before. <laughs> You're like a oh, basalt monolith, you, and you're like, this is three mana. Yeah. <laughs> I spent three mana to make three mana. Yep. Please. I have no way to take advantage of this. <laughs> yep. Um, 
Yeah, I I think it's going to be very interesting. It, it's going to be a tough thing to play at the table comfortably, but you just sort of have to know that you're the bad guy at the table, you're here to steal their cards, and you're here to beat them with them. And that's cool. That's a cool thing. It's fun. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> yeah. Probably not a more than once per night deck. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is the other thing. <laughs> Play groups can get a little testy. Great way to put it. Uh, but if you're playing across from it, recognize that they're doing a lot of work to take your cards. <laughs> it's probably not as scary as it looks. So spending a ton of resources to pick apart the Gaunti table player is is not necessarily worth your time. Yeah. But it's cool. It's fun and outlawed. Yeah. To the listeners. Uh, what do you think of this pre-con? Any cards we missed to add? I don't know. We did pretty well on this one. I feel good about it. Uh, any cards we suggested to take out or add that you disagree with? Are you a Minds Dilation stan? Are, do you, are you <laughs> here to speak for Deluvian Primordial? We want to hear it. Get in the comments. Yeah, come on. Get in the comments. Fight me. I know this is this is going to be one of the very popular pre-cons for this set. Yeah. Uh, Felix is already getting a ton of love. Gonti is a beloved character, and this is a strategy that people are really into. Um, so let us know if you've built it, what you put in it, what you've, you've probably even played it by now uh tell us what, what you think about this pre-con we're excited to find out super cool super fun all right uh if you want to pick up any of these cards if you want to pick up this box of magic cards or any of the singles that we mentioned today go to cardkingdom.com slash command any amount of money that you spend at card kingdom helps us out and doesn't cost you any extra money plus card kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards so you can buy all a ton of the cards that you're looking for in one place. Uh, we've been putting deck lists for these bad boys in the show notes. So go down there to click the Archidec link. It'll tell you exactly what cards we added to the upgrade. You can add those to your cart on Card Kingdom. Make sure you're using that affiliate link and you're supporting the show while shopping, which is fun. Plus, they ship it nice and safe. They get it all packaged up in a little plastic case with a little packing peanut in it. And, and they tape. Had a you nice get little token. A little token, sometimes a sticker. Uh, I love shopping at Card Kingdom, and you can do so while supporting the show. Cardkingdom.com slash command. And once those cards are in your hand, of course, you're going to need to protect them from your opponents who are terrified of you. Go to ultrapro.com slash command. Yeah. When you're riding the Wild West, you're going to need a you, satin tower. You got to have those custom sleeves mm -hmm. with your commander on them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cowboys are all about aesthetics, right? It's true. I feel like a cowboy loves a matching hat with a matching vest with a matching chaps yep. matching horse go all the way down uh all white car kingdom doesn't have chaps but you know they you know everything else ultra bros chaps for your cards and sleeves uh they have play mats they have deck boxes they have binders they've been releasing really cool binders for each set that are really high quality and like have the pattern on it so if you're the kind of person that likes to store your cards in binders it's a really great way to have a collection that looks cool and you know exactly where the cards from each set are uh plus if you're building gonti go get the play mat Oh, Go yeah. get the sleeves, get the matching deck box. You can show up fully decked out for your next game night and know your cards are safe in the meantime. Uh, again, ultrapro.com slash command. We've got a little bit of time. Uh, we're going to take a moment to talk about something outside the world of magic. Uh, do you have something that you're doing out that's not magic right now? I do. Well, yeah. I, I have something I want to talk about, yeah. which is the show Shogun. Oh, yeah. It's oh, so man. good. You've been watching it too, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this has been my like favorite show in a long time. It's awesome. I, it's like so beautiful and it's very violent. Uh, if you're, it's violent. It takes place in 1600s Japan. Yep. Uh, when you know there, there's this whole period between one ruler and his son coming mm -hmm. to age and stuff, and it's about like the first Englishman to uh, land in Japan, and it's fictional, yeah. but it's based on like a lot of real history. He's like a he's like a British pirate -ish. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, yeah, he's... He's a smuggler. He's a privateer. Uh-huh. So he, they've been hired by the uh -huh. British Empire to be a pirate against Spanish and Portuguese ships. Mm -hmm. um, but then he crash lands in Japan. It is so good. Yeah. I just read the book, oh, yeah? like, a couple months ago. How and are they stacking up? They're great. I, I mean, it's followed the book really well. It's, like, really done a good, you know, job by the mm. book. I didn't even know they were making a show of it mm. when I read the book. And then, like, right as I finished it, all these ads started coming out for Shogun, and I was like, ah! <gasps> Did I manifest this? <laughs> it's really, really good, and... It 
a lot of it is in uh, subtitles. It's in Japanese. Yeah. So what I, I really like that I have to put put what I'm doing down and watch the show. Yeah, actually pay attention to it. Yeah, it's like training for way, if you're like me and you're off and on arena. Um, I, I'm really glad that they decided to just like make most of it in Japanese. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be Shogun if it wasn't in Japanese. And like, there's some that's in English. There's a translator, and of course he speaks largely English, although he's learning Japanese as the show goes on. So. I, I will point out this little yeah, detail that yeah. I think is is showing that they are willing to compromise mm-hmm. for those who don't just want to read subtitles the whole time. Yeah. Technically in the book, while the main character does speak English, mm-hmm. the only language he can communicate with people in... Uh-oh. Yep, pipe gone. The only <laughs> language he can communicate with people in yep. in Japan is Portuguese. So it could have the show could have been in half in Portuguese and half in Japanese. It could have been even better. In the book, he also speaks in Latin about half the time. Oh my god. So the book is torn between Latin, Portuguese, and Japanese, although Latin and Portuguese are just written in English in the book. Right. And in the book... And Japanese is written in Japanese in the book? Ha- about half the time. Okay. So they'll sometimes be, you know, written in not Japanese not characters, characters but it'll like say the word out sure. when he's hearing it and then right. someone will explain it and then other times you'll actually know what they say. Mm-hmm. But whatever in the book they're speaking Latin, they just add these and thines. <laughs> <laughs> to show that it's Latin, it's like, thou art my favorite. And it's like, oh, they're speaking Latin. Latin. <laughs> the show's really sweet. Uh, if you're into sort of prestige TV, especially historical stuff, it's really fun. Yeah, it's a blast. Um, yeah, check it out. I highly recommend it. Uh, before we go, we got to say a big thank you here to our amazing team at the Command Zone. Thank you to Damon Lentz, Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Arthur Meadowcroft, Manson Long, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Liberger, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, Josh Lee Kwai, Jimmy Wong, and, of course, to Jordan for taking the time to record this episode. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, talking about a little crime yeah. and punishment. Let's be criminals with no punishment. Less, I don't want punishment. Less punishment. Only crime. Only crime. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>